September 21st. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to support those who are tempted. Hebrews 2.18 Do you think, my reader, was it no humiliation for the Son of God to be thus assailed by the Prince of Darkness? Was it no degradation that his dignity would be questioned, his authority disputed, his reverence for and allegiance to his father assailed, and his very purity tampered with by a fallen and corrupt spirit whom he had ejected from heaven? Ah, how deeply and keenly he must have felt it to be so. The first moment he was brought in contact with his arch fiend and subtle foe of God and man. But oh, what glory beams from beneath this dark veil of Christ's humiliation. How lovely and precious an object does he appear to saints and angels in this wondrous transaction. What holy sympathies and fond affections are kindled in the heart and rise towards him as the eye surveys each particular. The appealing nature of the onset. The shock which his humanity sustained. The mighty power by which he was upheld. The single victory. The signal victory which he achieved, the divine consolation and comfort which flowed into his soul as his vanquished enemy retired from the conflict, leaving him more the conqueror, and above all, the close and tender sympathy into which he was now brought with a tempted church. These are features replete with thrilling interest and rich instruction, on which the renewed mind delights to dwell. But our Lord's humiliation went deeper still than this. The clouds now gathering around him grew darker and more portentous as he advanced towards the final conflict. We must consider the first step of his bearing sin, the painful consciousness of which increased as the hour of its atonement drew on and forming one of the most overwhelming demonstrations of that voluntary abasement to which he had stooped, and through which he was now passing. In the following passages, this great truth of the gospel is explicitly and emphatically stated. And let it be borne in mind that when the Holy Spirit represents our Lord as bearing sin, the statement is not to receive a figurative, but a perfectly literal interpretation, as asserting a solemn and momentous fact. He bore not the appearance of sin, or the punishment merely of sin, but the sin itself. Thus does the Holy Spirit declare it. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He shall bear their iniquities. He bear the sins of many, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. He has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. There stood the eternal God in the closest proximity to the evil one. Never did two extremes so opposite to each other meet in such near contingency and collusion. Essential sin, essential holiness, essential darkness, essential light, essential hatred, essential love, man's deadliest foe, man's dearest friend. What an hour of seeming power and triumph was this to the grand adversary of God and man. What an hour of deepening gloom and humiliation and defeat to God's beloved son. How would this Lucifer of the morning exult as with the swellings of pride he placed his foot upon incarnate deity how keenly and powerfully conscious would Jesus be at that moment of the deep abasement and degradation to which he had now sunk. But behold how this great transaction contributed to the deep humiliation of the Son of God. What must have been the revulsion of moral feeling, what the shrinking of his holy soul the first instant it came in personal contact with sin. What a mighty convulsion must have rocked his human nature, pure and sinless as it was. Saint of God, 
what composes your bitterest cup, and what constitutes your keenest deep sorrow. Has a tender father blown upon your blessings, removed your mercies, lessened your comforts, darkened your bright landscape, dried up your sweet spring? Is this the cause of your shadowed brow, your anxious look, your tearful eye, your troubled and disconsolate spirit? Ah, no, you perhaps exclaim, rid me of this body of sin, and you chase the cloud from my brow, the tear from my eye, and the sorrow from my heart. It is the sin that dwells in me. Do you think, then, what the spotless Lamb of God must have felt? And how deeply must it have entered into his humiliation, the existence of an all-absorbing, ever-present, and ever painful and humiliating consciousness of bearing upon his holy soul iniquity, transgression, and sin?